day 266 of the Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Holly, and welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Hi, welcome back to Heart Dive. If you notice, I'm standing. I realize I need to be moving when I'm doing these Bible studies. I've gotten a little more monotonous, and I am so sorry if you've been listening along and paying attention to how I've changed and I've grown. But there's one thing that I've started to do and I'm leaving a little piece of me when I sit down in a chair. And so considering we're reading the book of Esther today, I said, let's go all in. This is one of my most favorite books and stories of the Bible. And the fact that it is named after a woman, yes, Esther, you know, being two books in the Bible, right? You got Ruth and you got Esther. So I'm so excited to dive into the book of Esther. But first, before we dive in, could you hit the roll call? Yes, for all the heart divers, Bible study friends who have been part of the family for quite a while, you know what that is. That's the little like button down below. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe. And yes, as always, that's your part of being part of a digital missionary field. The more engagement down below, positive or negative, it helps the algorithm know, hey, this content is worth checking out. Now, for all the people who are brand new to the podcast or the YouTube channel and found us because you're in the book of Esther, thanks for being here. We are part of the Heart Dive ministry that is growing from a grassroots smartphone in her backyard you know, on the beach of Hawaii of Kanoi Gibson's vision and the calling that the Lord has placed on her. And that is what we're going to read about today is a calling that the Lord has placed on Esther. But first, if you are looking for any more information, you can check us out at heartdive.org or our Facebook group or email us at hello at heartdive.org or heartdiveministry at gmail.com. And I highly recommend emailing us if you have something that you'd like to discuss with us. Again, heartdiveministry at gmail.com or hello at heartdive.org. I am checking that as well as Kanoi and one or two volunteers who have helped us, you know, step in and try to read through those and comb through all those. So if we haven't gotten to it, it's just a not yet. And one last reminder that we have an online shop for merchandise. So if you're looking for sweatshirts or hats or a little canvas tote with the Heart Dive um, logo, we have that available as well, but it's going to close on October 7th. All right, let's dive into God's word by praying first so we can get the posture of our heart correct. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Um, We come to you and ask that your will be done as it is on heaven, that we seek your will, your spirit, and your discernment, Lord, to make the desires of our heart yours. Have the word come alive in a new way that maybe it's never been before. And also, Lord, if there's any transgressions in our heart keeping us from being able to dive in deeper and closer to you, remove it, Lord. Remove any gunk that is, you know, clogging the arteries and the veins that allow it to pump for you, Lord and anything that's keeping us from having community and unity within our circles, um, our families, co-workers, wherever it may be, Lord. And I ask that you remove any distractions as we dive into this amazing book of Esther. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the book of Esther, so if you are interested, you can always get the poster from the Bible Project, and I have that link down below. So let's look at the historical context of the book of Esther first. So you're looking at about 55 years post-exile or the ending of the exile. So the Jews were in Babylon for 70 years, and then after the 70 years, they were given permission to return. Well, some didn't. Some liked that lifestyle, so they stayed. So these are Jews, Mordecai and Esther, some main characters here, that stayed in Babylon And now they're into the capital city of Susa. Susa is the capital for Persia because now it is the Persian Empire. It's no longer the Babylonian Empire. So these are Jews who stayed about 55 to 65 years after the end of the exile. So this also places it chronologically in the middle of the book of Ezra. We know that it's after the second temple has been built, which was in 516 BC. And then you have the King Xerxes or in the book in the ES 
the version it says ahasuerus 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 and so it's kind of like um, my friend said it's a dinosaur name with an a on it so ahasuerus i'm probably going to say xerxes because that's just a little bit easier and also that's the name i grew up with and i don't want to be stumbling over over the whole book so xerxes became king in 486 bc now what should we look out for in the book of esther one the name of god is not mentioned yes that's correct the name of god is not mentioned but that doesn't mean he's not there so that means that we can look for his sovereignty and his hand of influence throughout the book of esther next we also know that this has to do with the feast or holiday of purim p-u-r-i-m so this is a historical book in the old testament that's where esther lies so you probably were like oh we're going through we're almost to malachi er, nope you have to go back in your book back to the books of the history books and there's esther right there at the very end it's the very last book of history in the old testament so we learn about the holiday of purim now the last thing and something that i i personally noted is that we can take to heart the lessons on not being offended mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of people being offended throughout this book and we're going to learn what not to do Esther chapter 1, the king's banquets. Now, in the days of Ahasuerus, remember that I told you I'm probably going to say Xerxes. So, in the days of Xerxes, the Xerxes who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. And in those days, when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. We're establishing where when and who so xerxes is the son of darius and he is coming in after darius has failed to claim greece he also just died in egypt for another rebellion that was going on so they have this giant kingdom and i'll throw up a map giant kingdom from ethiopia all the way to india and this was a giant conquest one of the largest empires that ever was the persian empire and now xerxes is coming in to rule it after his father darius and he's got a chip on his shoulder darius did not defeat the greeks and so now he thinks he needs to go in and defeat the greeks so the army of persia and media and the nobles and the governors of the provinces were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days 180 days so 180 days is about six months and when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa. When you say the king gave for all the people present means that it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, you were invited to this event. And the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So everyone was invited to this feast and to this party of six months. So a lot of debauchery, a lot of drinking. Verse 6. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble, marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of proprietor and marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Who wants to sit on a couch made of gold and silver? That does not sound very comfortable. I don't know about you, but I would probably say no thank you. All right, let's keep going. So verse seven, drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. This is a very um, interesting edict. And what you have to understand about the context and cultural environment here, if the king had a sip of his drink, you were commanded to also have a sip of your drink. That's how you honored and respected the king. So he's saying, drink whenever you want or don't drink at all. You have complete liberty. So what do you think people did when they were not held to the customs of the king? Or if the king didn't want to drink that night, where? Well, no one had to drink, right? No one was allowed to drink. But now if the king ain't drinking, that doesn't matter. You can drink all you want. Or if the king is drinking and he's getting, you know, drunk, you don't have to. But let, let, let's be honest, this is six months of partying. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. All right, so for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. All right, told you, it's just nothing but debauchery. 
In verse 9, Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus or Xerxes. Now, this is interesting because it's implying that the sexes did not intermingle in the society. Some scholars disagree with that. They say that women were allowed into the inner court. Um, obviously, they probably had concubines and um, women playthings in there. So I can't imagine with this opulence that's just pouring out everywhere that they didn't have women there. But the fact that he's the queen isn't there is important. So we're moving on to the next section, section, which is verse 10, Queen Vashti's refusal. So on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry and with wine, very nice way of saying he was um, drunk and his reasoning went out the window. He commanded Mahamam, Bishtha, Harbana, Bigtha, and Abigathi, Zathar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. He requested that the queen come so they can look at her and Google at her and oogle, Google, (laughs) oogle at her. That's what he wanted. He wanted her to be a plaything. This is the queen of one of the mightiest empires going on right now. And he's like, come on out here and show us your beauty. No. And what's also interesting to note here is that this line implies he requested her to come not only and show off her beauty, to come in just her crown. So he wanted to show her off in her full birthday suit. This went against the custom, if implying here, that women were not allowed in the inner court society of the men. Also, it is said that the Persian women who were of status, normally were not seen or gazed at as much in society. Also, they wore a veil. So it was a way of keeping modesty and purity there because this is his wife, his queen, and he just broke all kinds of customs because he was married with wine. So in verse 12, we get a response to this. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Well, again, all the reasoning has went out the window because he is married with wine and it's very disgraceful because now his pride is offended. Then the king said to the wise man who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him being Karshina, Shathar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, and Mimukon, the seven princes of Persia and Media who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti, because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs. Then Mamukan said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are all are all in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. Okay, y'all, that's a pretty big claim to say that she has offended all the men in the area, every one of them. Verse 17, for the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. All right, there's a couple of things to note here. One, the king goes and seeks counsel because his you know, feelings are hurt. And he's also seeking counsel when everyone is drunk with, you know, the wine that's flowing freely and he's the king so not everyone close to him has his best interest in mind so he said <laughs> let's get one of this queen because obviously she stands her ground and we can't have that we need a naive quiet you know doormat as a queen and he's saying let's get rid of her because now she's telling all the women that they also need to hold contempt for their husbands and i'm going to tell you right now i think vesti is one of the heroines in here she's one of the icons i am happy and proud of her for standing up and saying, no, I will not stand for this immodesty and immorality of my body being oogled at in my own kingdom and by my own husband. All right, ladies, I need y'all to check in down below. Let me know, would you honor a request from your husband to do that? All right, continuing from that, since they will say King uh, uh, Xerxes, y'all, this is Xerxes, I'm struggling. King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him and she did not come this very day the noble women of persia and media who have heard of the queen's behavior 
will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repel, repealed, that Vesti is never again to come before King Xerxes. So what do we have going on here? We have an offended ego. We have an offense of pride that is also being hindered by the drinking of wine. And he's listening to all these people. And of course, it sounds good to him. He's saying, don't, everyone needs to know that women can't do this. They can't say no to the men. They can't say no to their husbands. And they certainly can't say no to the king. So therefore, let's make an edict that cannot be overturned, that cannot be turned away and tell them all that now the queen can't come into the king's presence. Offense, offense, offense. The king is offended. His officials are offended, you know, offended. And through it, they don't use reasoning or sound judgment. They are not wise. So you have wine and unwise counsel versus sound judgment and rationalization. So we need to check our own hearts of when we are offended. And I'm going to tell you right now, doing this ministry with Kanoi has been one of the most revealing pieces of my heart. I am easily offended. Yes, I am. And I have been my whole life. And I have told Kanoi that if I would have jumped on this bandwagon with her of this ministry two years ago, three years ago, I couldn't have handled it. I couldn't have done this. I would have been so afraid of what people would say or how people would judge me. And I would have stayed hidden, just like Esther, hiding my identity in Christ, hiding my passion for the Lord, which is why I just changed everything up here. And I'm speaking from my heart because that, that is what I'm most passionate about. It's the gospel. It is getting the word of God out and sharing it in the way that it means to me. When I read the words of God, I am not ashamed. So heart check. Do I let my pride dictate my actions, leading me to make decisions based on offense rather than wisdom? And how can I cultivate humility to avoid falling into the trap of pride and offense? So Vashti is never again to come in front of the king. So let's continue from that. And we're going to be starting in the middle of verse 19. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all the kingdom, throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. So they're saying honor here, but this is subservient, obedient doormat. They say <laughs> no woman can speak up to her husband pretty much. So verse 21, this advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mimukan proposed, and he sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be a master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. Esther chapter 2. So this is Esther is chosen as queen. So after these things, when the anger of King Xerxes had abated, all right, that right there had abated. That lets us know that he has moved on from Vashti, about two years has passed, and also the debauchery from chapter one is no longer ongoing because he was just defeated by the Greeks. So he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, oh, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, upon under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and he did so. So the king is sad. How do we make him better? Let's get a whole bunch of young virgins who are probably between the ages of 12 and 14 and they make them really beautiful with this six to 12 month beautification process. I don't think that was really wise counsel once again. So we're going to continue with this advice. Now we're in verse five. We're going to shift stories real quick. In verse five, now there was a Jew and they, when this is written like that, there was a Jew. This is kind of a derogative term for the Jews who were there from the exile. So there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. 
Now, Mordecai is a Jew, but Mordecai, the name, is Babylonian, and we do not know what his real name was in Hebrew. So Mordecai, the son of Heir, son of Shimi, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, Jeconiah, king of Judah. So that means if he came during that deportation, he was perhaps a noble, uh, someone of nobility or a craftsman. So therefore, he probably had a high ranking spot within this kingdom or the Babylonians. And so therefore in Persia. All right. So the uh, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadessa. That is Esther. So Hadessa in Hebrew was myrtle, you know, the myrtle tree. And Esther means star, and that's her Babylonian name. So Hadessa, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. So continuing that Mordecai was raising up his niece, the young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. So that right there is an indication of just how beautiful she was because it's um, paralleled or similar to Sarah, which was Abraham's wife. And you don't hear that a lot in the Bible. So she must have been very, very beautiful. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. This goes out to all the people who are raising children who are not their own. Anyone who has stepped into the role to raise someone up, foster care or relative, Thank you. Thank you for being a father or a mother to the fatherless and motherless. Thank you for being there for the orphans. Thank you. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, that's important because it's the custody of Haggai here, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women, and the young woman pleased him and won his favor. Now, you're going to hear this over and over. This woman must have been, Esther, very beautiful and also kind and had a favorable demeanor. I don't think just her beauty would have won people over. I think she had a very kind heart. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Now, people have tried to connect the name Esther to a Hebrew name that um, has its roots in the word hidden or hide. And I find that interesting because what's happening right now, Esther is hiding her identity. And this is laying the groundwork, the framework for the overarching theme of this racial, racial tension that is in the book of Esther. Because what's happening is the Jews are still looked down upon because they are exiles and, you know, the Persians and the Babylonians conquered them. And there's still a lot of hate from all the nations that have been defeated by them because they're all now in a melting pot of citizenship of this empire. So continuing in verse 11, and every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Xerxes after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. Woo! Six months of one treatment and six months of another. That is 12 months of beautification. I, and immediately I said, ooh, I would love 12 months to beautify myself now or even before I got married. Because then maybe I could, you know, get rid of some of this fluffiness from all these kids. But that was a selfish desire. Immediately, the spirit spoke to me and he goes, um, you are beautifying yourself. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, you have those conversations, you know, it's a conversation with the spirit. And he's like, it's your heart. Every day that you write God's word on your heart and you spend time in his word, I am beautifying you from the inside out. And it's a process called sanctification. And y'all, there ain't nothing better than the sweet, sweet smell of the beautification of our hearts with the word of God. 
So every day, which has been much longer than 12 months, I have beautified my heart so that when I walk through trials or at the mountaintops, I am shining with the glow and beauty of the Lord. And I smell the sweet, sweet aroma that is pleasing to the Lord. So heart check. Are you allowing God to beautify your heart through his word and presence? Or are you only focused on outward appearances? And what steps can you take to experience true spiritual renewal? All right, we're continuing with verse 13 after her beautification. So when the young women went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz. That's a hard one. The king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines, she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. Y'all, as a mother of two daughters, this one was hard because this means that she's a young virgin who is beautified just to go into a grown man who is much, much older, have a one night stand. And then she goes from this group of virgins into what's called the second harem. And then she lives there for the rest of her life. She is now his possession as a concubine. She may never see him again. And more than likely, she will not be his queen. And that's the life she is to live in this luxurious opulence of a gilded prison. So in verse 15, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. So she's showing much wisdom here. She's looking to the man who is closest to the king. So obviously he's the middleman between the virgins and the king. He's going to know what the king wants. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Now what I wrote about here is that that means that she was compromising. She was compromising her faith. She was compromising her culture and her traditions and anything that kind of separated her from the rest. All right. She was a Jew. So she was probably eating food she wasn't supposed to be doing. She was probably doing stuff at times of the month that she shouldn't have been doing. She was, you know, wearing certain things she shouldn't have been wearing. She was blending in and transforming, conforming to the world around her. And we know through the New Testament and even throughout the Old Testament that we are not to compromise our heart just for the society around us. You know, so that's why I said earlier, Vesti, she really stood out to me because she said no to the king. Mordecai and Esther could have said, no, we're not going to do this. But instead, they, they, you know, they cowered back. They're like, oh, OK, we'll just, you know, we'll compromise here. We'll compromise here. You know, we're going to live our life. You know, at least we're not being killed. This will be OK. It's just a little sacrifice. And it's the little sacrifices that lead to the big sacrifice. What's that? It's death. Oh, death, you have lost your sting, right? Well, guess what? We don't have to play victim or victimization to the compromising of our spirit in this world because we have victory over death through Jesus Christ. So heart check. Are you hiding your faith in situations where it matters most? And how can you be bold in living out your faith without compromising? So in verse 16, after she's winning the favor of everyone around, in verse 16, we continue... And when Esther was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tabith in the seventh year of his reign. So this is somewhere between 479 and 478, which is also around the end of the Greek, the Greece war, the war with Greece. The king loved Esther. Now, the word that they're using here for loved is not like the agape love or whatnot. It's more like the ero. So like uh, more of a physical love. So he loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Mordecai discovers a plot. So in verse 19, we start here. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now what's interesting here is he's talking about the virgins being gathered again. Now we have no idea why they're being gathered and we don't know why Esther was there. So in verse 20, 
Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai, just as when she was brought up by him. So it's saying that she still honors him like her father, but no one knows her connection to him. And so she's sitting out here near the gate with the virgins, so Mordecai could actually kind of have a secret conversation with her. So in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthon and Tirish, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, so these are people guarding the virgins, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. So what's interesting to note here that in the history books, King Xerxes actually is assassinated eventually by his own people. So in verse 22, in this came to the knowledge of Mordecai and he told it to Queen Esther and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. So she gave Mordecai the, the credit for this plot. When the F affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And we get a foreshadowing of some future books. When the gallows, they were hanged, but also there's a giant spike that your body would kind of be, you know, um, plunged up against as, after you die. And then also the fact that the story was recorded in the Chronicles. Esther chapter 3. After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. Now you may be wondering what's an Agathite, right? Or an Agagite? Agagite? It is actually not a group of people. It is a title. So history, if you've been with us all the way through, do you remember the story in Exodus and in 1 Samuel? King Saul was doing his rounds. He was getting rid of the people and killing them. And Samuel said, make sure you kill everyone, everyone, everyone. And then he doesn't kill one specific king. He's like, oh, I'll keep the king. We'll kill everyone else. And Samuel rolls up on the scene and he goes, hey, did you kill everyone? And he's like, yeah, I did. He goes, you didn't kill the king. Guess who the king was? King Agag. Yep, Agagite. A gag. So this is the king of the Amalekites. Amalekites. Huh. Amalekites. And so that means that this is a descendant of the Amalekites who are a enemy of the Jews. So this guy that we're about to read about, who is the next main character in the book of Esther, is a sworn enemy to the Jews. So in verse two, and all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But, hmm, but, Bort Mort Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, so this is a continual action of not paying homage, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he told them that he was a Jew. So he's saying, I'm a Jew. Like that was answer in itself. And guess what it was? Because Haman knew what that meant. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. So what does that mean? He was offended. Remember what I told you? Look for all the people who are offended and then look at their unreasonable reactions. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. See, there you go. That is the offense, that the reasoning that the offense led to. The people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. And in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast pur, pur, P-U-R, that is they cast lots. So this is important because we're starting to see the foreshadowing of the reason that this is in the history books because we're starting to see glimpses and little steps that led to Purim. Haman day after day cast those lots and they cast it in month after month till the 12th month which is the month of Adar. So this doesn't mean that he was casting it for 12 months. It means that he kept throwing the die until it landed on something. So then Haman said to the king Xerxes, there is a certain people intentionally vague, scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those who of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to be the king's prophet to tolerate them. Again, this ambiguity, I can't get that out. So it means that he's being very vague on purpose in the sense that he's saying these, not saying who they are, the Jews, and he also says their laws are different. Not that they're wrong, they're different. So if it pleases the king, 
let it be decreed that they be destroyed and I will pay you 10,000 talents. Y'all, that is a astronomical amount of money. He is totally bribing the king. And where is it going to come from? The Jews' blood. He's going to plunder the Jews and I will pay 10,000 talent, talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Look, his title is now the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So once again, horrible counsel given to the Xerxes and Xerxes obeyed it. So an absurd move by him once again. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. The signet ring means that it was the signature of the king and it had his official stamp of approval saying, yep, this is me. I approve it. Go to town. And everything that's written on it is written in a multitude of languages for a multitude of provinces. So this just went out across that whole big nation. Remember? Map. Boom. You see this map? This went everywhere. So this even included Jerusalem. So this is genocide. Again, the spiritual battle that is always at play of the enemy, the main enemy, Satan, who is trying to destroy God's chosen people. Once again, let's eradicate them all, annihilate them all from the face of this earth. So in 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So what's interesting here is that they have 11 months till this is going to be committed, and one day everyone killed, eradicated, annihilated, and people are allowed to plunder their goods. So that means that this is motivation and inspiration for doing so. And what you'll see in this book are, are a bunch of reversals. We'll see that in reverse, the Jews do not do the same thing. So in verse 14, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. Huh, so they're celebrating this. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Esther chapter 4. Esther agrees to help the Jews. So when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on a sackcloth and ashes. Now during this time, people didn't have a lot of clothes. So him tearing just this one outfit showed what distress he was in. So he put on the sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. So that means he was just at the gate where he could actually get access and show his remorse, access to Esther. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. How do you think you would react to a piece of paper being, you know, stapled or nailed to the wall of your church saying, guess what, Christians, you're going to die on this day 12 months from now. Say your goodbyes now. That, that's essentially what is happening. They're being told that they're going to be annihilated and they're told ahead of time. So, of course, they're going into mourning and distress. Their lives are about to be ended and they know when it's going to happen. Just because. Just because one man was offended. He said, erase them all from the face of this earth. So in verse four, when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deep, deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. So in verse five, then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, and he had been appointed to a tender and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him in the exact sum of money, see, money, that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. 
Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. So this means that this eunuch who was um, appointed to Esther must have known she was a Jew because he's communicating between Mordecai and her. So she has, you know, kind of let a few people in on the secret or maybe not. Maybe, you know, she said he's someone that she cares about and raised her, but he's clearly a Jew. People know he's a Jew and now he's mourning in the streets and only the Jews would be doing that. So this I, Holly, not a scholar, is assuming this is someone on the inside who knows Esther's secret, her hidden identity. All right. And Hatchat went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king for these 30 days. So you can't approach the king without permission or you would actually be killed. So he has to show you favor by touching the golden scepter. So in verse 12, and they told Mordecai what Esther has said. And then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For... If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we come to the famous words of the book of Esther. Have you not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We can take away three questions from this, in this conversation that's happening between Mordecai. He's asking, where has the Lord placed you? And what has the Lord now called you to do? And will you obey? That is the simplest heart check that you can have right now. Ask yourself, where has the Lord placed you? What is he calling you to do? And will you obey? Because this is twofold. What did he say right before this? What did he say Right before that line, the most famous line, the one that I live by, like, have I not been created for a time like this? A time where actually digital ministry exists. I love learning about the audio, the light situation, multiple cameras, laptops. Like, I love this. Was I not made for a time like this for digital ministry? But if you shun the calling of the Lord, he will call another. And that is what Mordecai says before that. He says, if you won't do it, someone else will. God will appoint someone else to step into this position. And this is how we start seeing the fingerprints of God everywhere. We start to see that even though his name is not mentioned, that the sovereignty of placing a Jew into such a royal high position within the kingdom to stop the plot of a genocide of his chosen people is God's hand and sovereign hand at work. So heart check. What has God placed before you for such a time as this? And are you prepared to say yes or are you holding back in fear? All right, so what does Esther do in response to this challenge by her uncle or was it uncle, cousin, Mordecai? Her father, Mordecai. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So what we see here from Esther is that she sought wise counsel. She went to Mordecai. She, you know, talked with him. She listened to the needs, the needs of the people around her, which were her Jewish people, the Jews. And then she saw the Lord with the fasting. She spent three days in supplication to him, petitioning to him. But the most important one is four. She acted. She became a doer of the word. If I perish, I perish. 
Are we that bold with our faith today? Esther chapter 5. Esther prepares a banquet. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters. So here she's doing everything she can to earn his favor, even dressing up, putting on the, the, the oils, the, the aromas, the, the royal robes. She needs to earn his favor. And while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace, and when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. A little side history here that I read in the commentaries is that Xerxes actually allowed a couple other people to touch the scepter, but they didn't turn out as well. So one, a woman wanted to, you know, get his favor in the bedroom and she got it. And then when his queen, which is in the history books, the queen that we know about, because Esther's not in history book, they don't have any evidence of her, um, was Amistris. And she got really upset and vengeful. So she went in and got to touch the scepter and she ended up setting up a domino effect for his downward spiral um, because she got revenge on that woman. So it didn't turn out well for him for giving uh, favor to people, but we don't know when this happened. Did this happen before all that or after? But just a side history note. So in verse three, after she touched the scepter and the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given, to, uh, it shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. Now, what's interesting to note here is that the king normally ate alone. He would drink wine in the company of others, but he ate alone. So the fact that the queen invited the king and Haman was a huge honor to Haman. But we know why she's doing that. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom. Y'all, this is you know, hyperbole. He's not, he doesn't really mean that. So even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request is if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So she's here setting it up. So she's, you know, kind of softening them up to the big confrontation request that she has for the king and she has Haman here so she's being very very wise here so you start to see a glimpse of how she has won the favor in many many eyes of people so now we're going to see the plot for to hang Mordecai so in verse 9 and Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart now let's talk about he was probably drunk on wine really proud and pompous he was oh I've been honored by the queen so he's walking around all proud with his chest puffed out but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he neither rose nor trembled before him he was filled with wrath against Mordecai this is all due to his cruel vanity he's proud he's pompous and now he's offended once again Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh, and Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, and all the promotions with which the king, with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, then Haman said, he went through this whole list of all the great things that have happened in his life to listing his children, his wife, the promotions, the treasures, and even, you know, what he was able to do with his positions. Yet, he's about to complain. And isn't that true? We have 24 hours in the day. And all it takes is one small offense, one small little incident, and your entire day is ruined. You're driving around town and someone cuts you off. And then the rest of the day, you're, that person cut me off in the road. I've seen this. Or, you, you know, for me, if you're walking around and doing something, I'm going to give you a little heart check here for me. I'm driving through town and I'm in the state of Georgia and it is a hands-free phone situation. And I'm sitting at a red light and I'm holding the phone out and I'm doing like voice notes. I'm just talking into my phone and giving it a voice. I'm not looking at it, I'm not, but it's in my hand. That counts. 
compromise people compromise and i'm holding it and i'm just like blah, 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 da, 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 da. I, right now at a red light i'm not driving and i sit it down when i start to move and i just kind of look over and it's a cop y'all my heart sank to the bottom of my stomach i was so convicted in that moment i literally looked at him and i went boop and i just dropped the phone when i did this i was he was giving me the side eye y'all it was like If you're not watching this on YouTube, <laughs> you need to come back and watch this. I was so convicted in my heart. And guess what? It ruined the rest of my day. The rest of the time I was so convicted and, and, and just so wrapped up that I had offended him or, you know, I've been offended that he was offended and it just ruined the rest of my time. So every time I get behind the wheel of the car, I'm like, don't pick up the phone. Don't pick up the phone. Don't pick up the phone. And that's a good conviction. But then sometimes we can be offended by our husbands or our friends or a coworker and you get rubbed the wrong way. And then your reasoning becomes overpowered by your greed or your pride. And you start to kind of want to kill someone in that, in that manner. And I don't mean kill someone physically. I mean, you're kind of killing their character. You're, you're associating them with this and you start to build up this litany of lit, this list that is saying, oh, they're horrible. They just don't care about people. They don't have compassion for people. They're not kind. We so easily fall victim to the victimization of offense. And so real quick, before I start, I do the heart check, I'm gonna throw out a couple books that have been given to me in the last year. And one of them recently, thank you, Darla, is Unoffendable. And then this other one is The Bait of Satan my sensitive heart my heart on my sleeve kind of person i'm so passionate and i just give and give and i get overzealous and i've been told my whole life you're a little too much you're a little too passionate bring it down a notch and then finally i'm in a place where i can actually just let that passion go and people don't like it and i tried to change for it and I've tried to push my voice down and to fit into a box because I offended someone. Well, I'm sorry if it did, but I gotta be true to what the Lord is teaching me and showing me. Is there room for improvement? Hallelujah, yes there is, because I have a teachable spirit. And so in, inside of every single offense, I will look for the gold nugget that the Lord or the Spirit's trying to tell me. But I will also have discernment from wise counsel that we see throughout each and every one of these books and chapters that you seek the counsel and you're able to look at it through eyes that are through the spirit, through the lens of the gospel. So heart check, do we allow offense to consume us or do we respond with grace and forgiveness? And how can we practice letting go of offenses quickly and with love? And so what did Haman say after all those great things. He said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited to her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. So this right here means that he's gonna build the gallows tonight, kill Mordecai in the morning, and then go see Queen Esther. And this idea pleased Haman and he had the gallows made. And y'all, that's where the cliffhanger hangs. That is the end of day 266 video. And so be back tomorrow for the second half of the book of Esther. So what do we have for our deep dive questions? In chapter one, how does King Xerxes' pride and drunkenness lead to poor decisions? And how does this warn us against letting our emotions control our actions? Reflect on Esther's time in the palace. How did the processes of beautification and Esther's story connect to our spiritual journey of sanctification? Mordecai asked Esther to hide her identity. How does this relate to the temptation to hide our faith in difficult situations? And how should we balance wisdom with boldness? Haman's hatred towards Mordecai leads him to plot against the entire Jewish people. What can we learn from this about the dangers of unresolved pride and prejudice in our own lives? 
In Esther 4, chap- chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai challenges Esther to consider her divine purpose. What moments in your life might God be calling you to act for such a time as this? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in all of your sovereignty and your divine orchestration of events, even when we cannot see your hand at work. Just as in the story of Esther, where your name is not mentioned yet, your presence is felt. Help us to trust in your plans for our lives. We acknowledge that you are always working behind the scenes, weaving every detail into a tapestry of redemption and purpose. Lord, we confess that like Xerxes, we often allow our pride and emotions to cloud our judgment. We seek your forgiveness for the times we have acted out of offense, anger, or hurt pride, rather than seeking your wisdom and guidance. Teach us, Lord, to be slow to take offense and quick to seek your heart in every situation. Grant us the humility to release our pride and submit fully to your will, knowing that your ways are higher than our ways. Father, we thank you for the example of Esther and the process of beautification that she underwent, both physically and spiritually. Help us to see that true beauty comes from a heart that is aligned with you, one that is daily being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Sanctify us, Lord, as we dive deeper into your word, allowing it to shape us from the inside out. May our lives reflect the beauty of Christ in all that we say and do. We also recognize the challenges that come with living out our faith in a world that often opposes your truth. Give us the boldness and courage to stand firm in our identity as your children, just as Esther eventually stood up for her people. Help us to discern when to speak up and when to act with wisdom and grace. Strengthen us, Lord, to never compromise our faith for the approval of others, but to always seek to please you above all else. Finally, Father, we ask that you open our eyes to the divine purpose you have placed before us, just as Esther was called for such a time as this. Help us to recognize the moments you have ordained in our own lives, where you are calling us to step forward in faith. May we be obedient to your calling, trusting that you will equip us for every good work. Lead us in boldness, grace, and wisdom as we walk in the victory that is ours in Christ. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.